Hi, everyone. I'm Richard Naylor from the Friends of the Pine Bush Board, and we're happy to again be able to partner with the Pine Bush staff, even though this time there's no cookies and uh, hopefully you brought your own. Um, I'm happy to tell you also that we will be having another program next month, and sometimes that's not so sure because the other person has to be set up and ready to do the Zoom thing. So next month, uh, that would be on the 16th of July, the science lecture is gonna be recovery efforts for the endangered carnaby butterfly. And that's gonna be kind of a history of what's been done as well as uh, how we're approaching it right now. We're very happy that our very own Steve Campbell, uh, he has a PhD and I, I know that uh, Dylan's gonna introduce him a lot better than that. But I just wanted to say uh, welcome uh, from the friends. And also, uh, I was told that if you want to use Q&A there, you just put your, um, your mouse down at the bottom of the screen and you'll see Q&A pop up and you should be able to ask questions and that will go to each panelist so they can answer uh, as they have a chance. So that'll fit in really well. So please be, be ready to do that. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over to Dylan, and she'll tell you about the Ant Trooper, and they'll tell you about the program. All right. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I think I look forward to these lectures, and um, even though we can't see you in person, it's really great um, that everybody joins us uh, for our webinars. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as Richard mentioned, this is Trooper, but I'm more excited about introducing our speaker for tonight, um, Chris. Um, I have known Chris since he started volunteering with us um, at our Sawet Banding Station, Sawet Owl Banding Station, um, in the fall of 2018. Um, and then I had a great time working with him last year. Um, he was one of our seasonal conservation science technicians um, and extremely hard worker, great guy to work with. Um, but a little bit more about his background. Um, he has a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Science and Biology from the College of Brockport and SUNY. Um, and he is currently um, pursuing a Master's of Science degree um, at the University of Albany SUNY um, in biodiversity, uh, conservation and policy. Um, and so that he's gonna be speaking with us tonight about his research for his master's work, um, master's of science thesis, um, which is using these drones to survey white-tailed deer populations. So um, with that, I wanna thank Chris so much um, for doing the lecture tonight and for doing it in this different format. Um, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Thanks very much. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna start sharing my screen now and you should be able to see the presentation. There we go. Yeah, so as Dylan mentioned, I'm Chris, um, and I'm gonna be talking to you tonight about how I have used drones to assess white-tailed deer abundance and habitat preference um, in the Albany Pine Bush Preserve. So here you can just see this picture. I thought this was a really great picture that we captured um, from one of our surveys. You can see um, kind of uh, an example of what the pine bush habitat looks like. You have dunes, sand, um, you have pitch pine, just a, a very um, diverse habitat with some deciduous forest in the back. And then it's also an urban ecosystem. So you can see University of Albany and then farther out, you can see um, some of the uh, large buildings in downtown Albany. I think that paints a really great picture of um, the area that I was studying. So a little bit more about me. So I'm a really big nature enthusiast. Um, I hunt and fish. Um, so as uh, Dylan said, I have a, a degree in environmental science and biology from Brockport. I'm also pursuing my master's in biodiversity conservation and policy from the University of Albany. She also mentioned that I'm a former Albany Pine Bush Preserve Commission seasonal employee. Um, so I worked under her um, and I became very passionate about the pine bush ecosystem. Um, and I'm also have, I have been very passionate about deer and deer management um, my entire life. Um, and I have many hobbies. I like to um, take pictures. I like to hike. Um, I've dabbled woodworking. Um, so I like to do a lot of things um, outside. 
Before I get started on my work, I'm going to talk about deer and then a little bit about the history of deer um, in North America and then kind of in the, the more local area. So this is the, the species that I'm going to be talking about tonight. You probably know of it. Um, it's the white-tailed deer, but more specifically, this is the subspecies um, Otocoilus virginianus borealis, so it's the northern hardwoods white-tailed deer. This is one of 38 recognized subspecies in all of um, the world, essentially. Um, we have, I believe, 19 in North America. Um, another example of a subspecies of white-tailed deer is the endangered key deer in the Florida Keys, so that's actually a white-tailed deer. Um, here in upstate New York, uh, deer are our keystone herbivore, so we really don't have any other large mammals that are herbivores. In other areas of the country, there are elk and moose and bison um, and mule deer. We don't have any of those species unless you're in the Adirondacks and there's the occasional moose. They're also an extremely hardy animal, so deer in New York um, and the Northeast generally have to deal with extreme variation in seasonality, so they have to go through the hard winter months with very little food. And then they also have to cope with the heat of the summer. So they're very, an extremely hardy animal. And they also have a really, um, they're also very culturally valuable. So people enjoy seeing white-tailed deer, myself included. You know, I, I hunt white-tailed deer, many people do. Um, some people just love having them around um, and just getting out to go see them. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of deer in North America. So deer haven't always been as abundant as they are today. Much like other species, um, deer have gone through kind of this cycle of being sort of abundant, you know, depending on the habitat. Um, and then there was a sharp decline when uh, Europeans first arrived. So Native Americans early on um, used deer in many ways, you know, for food, um, but also for clothing, uh, for ornate jewelry for tools. Um, so they had a big impact on deer populations and they also kind of managed the land to allow for a greater deer population. So they would burn land, they would, they had agriculture, um, and all of these things allowed for better deer habitat. And then as the Europeans arrived, more, hap uh, more land clearing happened, which allowed the habitat to, um, or all, allowed for more deer habitat, so deer increased. But then as trade for deer became, um, or as trade increased for deer, for deer meat and for deer hides, that's where the term a buck comes from, is actually from um, European settlers using a buck skin um, in trading. The amount of deer sharply declined. So you can see by 1900 on this figure to the right, there were very few deer in North America. Deer um, were almost extirpated from the state of New York. Um, it took protection and recovery. So states, New York included, developed um, hunting seasons and uh, trade limits on deer. And that allowed deer to recover. And then phase five talks about a changing paradigm. So people became more interested in having deer around hunters started managing their land to increase numbers. So that's why you can see that today, deer are historically almost as abundant as they have ever been, if not more abundant. In the pine bush, the story is not much different. So the pine bush habitat itself was formerly very remote and expansive. Um, it's estimated to be about 20, was to be about 25,000 acres, although it could have been upwards of 30 to 40,000. And Native Americans did live here. So they were the Mohawk and Iroquois tribes and they hunted for subsistence. So you can see up here in the top left, this is a picture of an arrowhead that my dad found actually just a few weeks ago while hiking in the preserve. Um, so that's evidence that hunters were active in the preserve. And fur was traded with the Dutch settlers very early on at Fort Orange and in Schenectady. So the Dutch settled this area first, they came up the Hudson. And you can see in the bottom left, that's a graphic of um, what looks like beaver hides and deer skin being traded between Native Americans and Dutch settlers. And then there you can also see a picture of what was um, a representation of Fort Orange. And then as English, the English arrived um, and the Dutch left, um, 
the English began to really hunt for subsistence and they did pretty hard work on the deer population. And then eventually um, deer were protected and then the pine bush was also um, preserved. And along that time, there was a long period of pine bush habitat conversion for development. So you can think about Albany, um, we have Crossgates Mall, Colony, um, all of those areas have been developed and it's a very urban area. So the preserve today is about um, 5,800 acres. So you can see that's the area in green, dark green and some light green. Um, and as I mentioned, it's really urban. So it's highly fragmented by roads and neighborhoods. And there's a really broad variety of habitat types. So we have the, the barrens, um, the pitch pine barrens. There are deciduous forests. There's pitch pine forests, many types of habitat. Um, there's some water, some um, vernal ponds. And the pine bush actively um, manages their habitat for this um, inland pine barrens ecosystem, which is a globally rare ecosystem. Um, so this, the Carner blue butterfly is the main species of management concern for the preserve. So that's the butterfly on the top right, it's endangered and there's federal protection on that. Um, and because of that, we're also able to enjoy the preserve um, in many other ways. And other than the butterfly, there's also other species that are um, at concern and can't manage for at the preserve. And these include birds. Um, there are many birds that are use the preserve. One of them is prairie warbler. Um, that's a bird that uses the pine bush. And then there's the whip poor will, um, which there is evidence of some of them as well. And then there's also the Eastern spadefoot, which is a toad that is not found very commonly in the Northeast, um, except it is found in the pine bush. And then same with the Eastern hognose snake. So the pine bush is really conserved um, and managed for these species, especially the carnivore blue butterfly and for the inland, inland pine barren ecosystem. But there are deer in the preserve. Um, so these are some of my pictures. Um, on the left, you can see a very young fawn, I would say she's, it is just days old. Um, they're born in the spring and then they grow up and in the summer, fall and winter months, they spend time with their family. So that middle picture is what I believe to be a mother and it's probably a yearling. Um, it's probably its offspring together and they forage and mate. Um, and they, they don't stay on the pine bush property. They don't, they're not limited by boundaries. So they cross boundaries into private property. And then eventually the deer will die obviously. Um, and that's a picture on the right of a carcass that we found last summer, um, actually in the study area that I'll be talking about. Deer are actually pretty significant in the preserve as well. So as I mentioned before, deer are keystone herbivores. So they're the only, really the only thing that gets out and is um, consuming large plant matter. Deer are also uh, vectors for ticks. So adult deer and they are um, reservoirs and mating sites for adult ticks. Um, and they will increase the abundance of ticks um, as well as Small mammals also increase the abundance of ticks, um, but deer themselves do not actually spread Lyme disease. So if a tick were to attach to a deer and it did not have Lyme disease, that tick would not end up with Lyme disease after being attached to the deer. Um, it's only small mammals that spread Lyme disease. So deer actually can act as kind of um, negative pools for Lyme disease, but they do increase the amount of ticks. Deer also um, have an interesting relationship with invasive species. So this picture on the top left that I have is a picture of multiflora rose and deer don't eat multiflora rose. So if these plants are established, they won't be grazed on by deer and they will continue to spread. Deer also do eat some invasive plants, including garlic mustard, and they can um, disperse those seeds. Um, so they can actually work to actively spread invasive species. And then deer are also appreciated in the pine bush. Um, I know many hunters that um, hunt in the pine bush. I have um, myself. And then there's also people that just like to get out and see deer. Um, so that's a big part of um, deer in the preserve. And then, you know, because they're an herbivore and they're eating plants, including um, the baby pitch pines that I have down here on the right, these seedlings, deer will eat those in the winter time. 
Um, and that can hamper recruitment. You know, they can spread, and spread invasive species. Um, all these things could have potential negative impacts on the pine barren ecosystem. So this is kind of why we need to monitor their abundance and understand um, how many deer there are and where specifically they are. However, it's difficult to obtain reliable abundance estimates for deer. Um, a lot of the methods are work intensive or they're expensive. So there's a few different methods um, to estimate population size and um, spotlight surveys and camera traps are two of them. And those were performed in the pine bush in the past and they um, gave abundance estimates. And another method is aerial surveys with helicopters. So you'll see there, I have a helicopter there um, and that's very expensive. So you have to hire a pilot to go fly your area. And oftentimes you can only afford to do that once. So with that aerial survey in mind, um, you can use drones in, to replace helicopters. And drones are a really new novel tool that are being used um, in a whole different sec uh, variety of sectors. Um, and drones and wildlife, they offer a faster and low cost aerial method um, compared to helicopters. And they can be flown uh, with lower detection from wildlife. So you can fly a drone over an area and it, the deer or other wildlife in the area won't be as keen to finding it, seeing it in the air as they would to a helicopter. And then drones can also be equipped with thermal sensors to aid in detection. And because of all of these things, they offer a high accuracy, offer high accuracy population data um, with good statistical strength. So you can really estimate abundance and potentially density very well. And this is a picture here of my uh, parrot Anafi thermal that we began to use. I eventually crashed this drone, um, but you can see it has that white camera on the front. It has a um, visible camera, so just a normal three band camera. And it also has right underneath that camera, a thermal sensor. So it records thermal and visible at the same time. And it's also a very small drone. After that crash, we actually moved on to um, this drone that's in the background, the DJI Mavic 2 Pro Enterprise Dual. So this is has the same camera as the Parrot Anafi Thermal. Um, you can see it has the visible camera there on the left and then the thermal camera there on the right. Um, and what we wanted to do is we wanted to perform relatively low cost deer surveys um, using this thermal imaging drone to assess white-tailed deer abundance and habitat use over time. Um, and we also use drones to map the study area to, uh, for an up-to-date um, habitat assessment. So if you look at Google Earth images, you will see a image of the pine bush that was probably taken in 2017 or 2018. And as we know that the, the pine bush habitat is managed every year um, and things change very quickly. So it, it's important for us to have an up-to-date map of the area. So that's what we, we did eventually. So for our abundance assessment, what we had to do is we had to develop these flight plans in order to return to the area multiple times. So in the um, app that you fly the drone with, there is a way that you can build a plan and save it so that when you go to the area, you can tell the drone to play and it will go up and it will fly the area on its own and it will come back. And you can do that multiple times. So that allowed us to repeatedly fly over the study area and record it in thermal video, but we also have it in visible as well. So it records both at the same time. And then once we have the video from our three sites, I was able to take the videos and analyze them to find the deer and determine their location. And then from there, we were able to de determine some spatial patterns, their habitat use, and then um, most importantly, their density. So getting into the details of the study here, um, this is the study area. It is in what's known as Blueberry Hill. So this is Route 155, kind of running down the left side and Washington Ave Extension and the throughway um, above. So I don't know if many of you are familiar with this area, but it's um, kind of, an, I think of it sort of as an island. It's very locked by urban development. Um, and the first location is that one in the top right. That's location one. It was about 0 0.3 square kilometers, about 75 acres. Location two is the one, the lowest one there in the middle. And that was a little bit larger at 78 acres. And then location three um, was smaller at 58 acres. So these are those flight plans that I was mentioning that we built. And then once 
we were able to do that. I was able to um, repeatedly fly them. So I want to show you an example of what we would do when we got there. So we would set up the drone at our launch points. Um, and this is what a video would look like. So we would adjust the settings of the thermal camera so that we appeared really hot up against the landscape and we would tell it to play and the drone would rise and then just begin along the flight plan. So this is typically how we would start and this is what we would be seeing. You can see there we are the hottest thing on the landscape. And lucky for us, deer also have a similar body heat, so they also appear about the same color. That gets me into what we see actually when we're looking for deer. So hot spots become visible mid-flight. So you can see on that top right picture, those would be five deer in their thermal signatures. Um, so as I mentioned before, the visible and thermal are recorded simultaneously. So this is actually two pictures of the exact same time in the video. Um, and you know there's five, but how many do you see in that um, visible image? You know, I can make out one for sure, um, but with the thermal, it's very obvious that there are five. And that's what makes this thermal so important. And then I wanted to show you an example of what it looked like mid-flight as we come across them. So it's continuing down its flight plan. And we would be seeing this live on an iPad. And then the hot spots would become visible. And we would pause the drone and get a good feel for how many of them there were. And I can adjust which way the drone is facing. So there you can see one in the center of the frame. And then there's about four of them down there now in the center of the frame. And you can see them moving. So this is real time. Then eventually, after I think I found them all, we would continue along the route, which the drone is about to do here. Hopefully this looks better for you than it does to me. It looks really uh, blurry to me. It was not this blurry. So I want to play a quick game with you guys to de uh, demonstrate why thermal is so important. Um, so I'm going to call this game, How Many Deer Are There? I want you to take a close look at this picture here and try and find all the deer that are there. I'll give you a few seconds here. So you're probably seeing a few. They're there, but they're camouflaged really well, you can see. Hey Chris, while people are counting, your audio is getting a little scratchy. I'm not sure if, uh, yeah, just a little bit. We can still understand you, but it's just getting a little staticky. Okay. I'll try and talk a little slower, see if that helps. Also looks like Dan guess, guesses five or more. And we have a couple questions, Chris, if you wanna take them. I see that, yeah, I'll take some. Um, so April says, what time do you usually go and does it matter? Yeah, April, that's a good question. So we would always go um, at about sunrise. So all flights occurred, I get into this a little bit later, but all flights occurred within an hour of sunrise. So we would typically get there five, 15 to five minutes before sunrise and then it would take about, I see the next question, how long would it take to fly the study area in a single time? It took about an hour, so we were there from sunrise till about an hour after sunrise. Um, and it took about, um, each flight, each study area was about 11 to 13 minutes in flight time or each location. So it was about a total of 34 minutes of flight time and we were there for an hour. So there was some hiking in between. And it does matter um, what time because of um, the sun actually plays a major factor in detection, which I'll get into a little bit later. So you've got guesses from five up to nine for how many deer. All right. Well, I will get on to the next slide here. And then there's the thermal picture. Um, and you can definitely tell how many hot spots are right underneath it. 
So I'll give you a second to look at that. And then there's the picture again. You might be able to see them a little bit better. And then there they are. One, two, there's eight there. And they're all lying down. Um, it's very difficult to see some of the ones that are there on that brown patch um, and then the ones under that tree. But why, with the thermal, it's very obvious. So I'm gonna have you do a little bit of a harder one here. There is deer there, don't worry. Um, I want you to look for them and kind of guess how many. Uh, Kiko asks, how high is the drone? The drone flies at about 95 feet. Um, so that's about the optimum height and distance to be able to see deer with the resolution of the camera. Um, and it's also above all the trees. So I'll throw the thermal image on top of this. It's a little bit harder to tell, um, but you can see some hot spots out there. Um, at least my trained eye can. And then here's the picture of it again. You might be able to see them now. And there they are, there's three. There's the two on the left that are standing together and then the third one all the way over on the right. And then here's the last one. This one might be the hardest. Um, there's a, an obvious few, but don't be fooled. How do the deer typically react to the drone? I'll get into that a little bit later, but they typically don't have much reaction. So you can see they're all laying down here and as the drone went by, um, they don't get up. They don't, they don't really uh, have much of a reaction. So you might be seeing a few, um, but there's the thermal picture. So there's the picture again. And then I'll circle them for you again. So there's actually eight here again. There's two up there on the top right. Um, it's really hard to see this, the one on the left there, but in the thermal, uh, it's clearly there. There's one laying down on the top left, um, almost invisible. Same with the one um, directly underneath that, it's almost not visible. And then some more obvious ones there. So this little game was to demonstrate why thermal is so important in this process. You know, you can have a drone and go fly um, that just says the visible, but it will be really difficult to get an abundance estimate with just the visible drone. Um, thermal is what really makes this possible. But thermal has some issues. So there's some factors that um, influence the detection. So one of these major factors is weather. Um, and one of the, the questions really was, you know, what time of day do you do it and does it matter? It definitely matters. So the time of day influences um, the, uh, the sun. So the sun comes up and it heats up the landscape. So you can see on that top right picture, um, that's a very sunny day and everything is very warm looking and bright as opposed to the picture directly underneath that, the bottom right picture, it was a cloudy and cold day. And so I wanna mention that this is a creek running through. You can see the, the warm creek. Um, so that's what you're seeing there, the warmth. But other than the warm creek, you can see that everything is very blue. And then the top left picture, um, it's a little bit warmer. There's probably no clouds. So you can kind of tell that there is a warm creek there, but everything else appears fairly blue. And then the bottom left picture, there was probably a little bit of sun and it was probably warm that day. Um, so it doesn't appear as blue on the ground. The trees you can see are red. The creek does not stand out as well. So these are some things that um, influence um, how the deer will appear and if they will be kind of hidden. Another thing that would hide them is the canopy composition, so the trees. Um, obviously, the number of trees will influence it. So you can see here um, on the bottom right, there is uh, there are a lot of trees there um, that have some kind of heat coming off of them. And if there were a deer standing behind those trees, it would be really hard to see them. Same with the top left picture. Those are pitch pine, which are um, coniferous trees, and they have a much thicker canopy, and the canopy is there all the time. And you can actually see three hot spots there. There's one on the very top 
um, sort of on the left side of the image, and then two kind of in the middle right. Um, those are deer hotspots, but there's actually nine deer in that frame. And the reason I was able to see that is because I was able to fly and look down through the trees in real time. However, in this image alone, you cannot tell that there are nine deer there. You can only see three. Um, and then the number of leaves is a major factor. Um, so when there weren't leaves out in March, um, we could see right through the trees. And then when leaves became, um, when leaves popped, you really couldn't see through the canopy that well. And as I mentioned, part of the study, um, we wanted to have a accurate habitat map. Um, so we wanted to have update, you know, we didn't want to just use what Google had. Um, so we use these drones. This is a um, DJI Phantom 4 Pro and then the DJI Inspire 2. Um, these drones are very useful in mapping. Um, and we use this program called uh, Universal Ground Control Station to develop these flight plans similar to what I was mentioning um, with the app. You can develop flight plans. And then we also perform multiple flights over the area, pretty similar to with the video, except these take images. So it takes images that have overlap, about 80% overlap. Um, so in this whole area itself, it was probably close to a thousand individual images. Um, and then this program called Agisoft is used to generate orthophoto maps. So this is what this image is, is an orthophoto map of the study area um, comprised of over a thousand images. Um, and it has a pixel resolution of 2.3 centimeters, so it's very high resolution. If you were able to um, zoom in on this map like I can um, on my desktop, you would be able to see uh, it's very high resolution. Um, there are actually a couple turkeys down in the bottom right area that you can make out very clearly. You can zoom in and see with uh, a really high level of detail. So we did this, so this is location one and two. There's also one of these for location three. So I'm gonna get into a little bit of my results now. So I did 34 total surveys. So that's from March 9th to May 22nd. So, and I was, as I mentioned, all flights occurred within one hour of sunrise. Um, that was to deal with um, some of the influence of the sun and temperature. And I had nearly 20 hours of video to go through and that was over 950 gigabytes of files. Um, so I had that stored on an external hard drive. And then we spotted um, 405 total deer so I want to mention that those aren't um, 405 individuals. It's probably um, a large number of the same individuals spotted multiple times. It's very hard to say um, how many individuals that we saw. But I was also able to get the locations. So I have 143 locations for those 405 deer. Um, the reason why it's not 405 locations is because I um, did a, I, for a single group, so deer are often in groups, I would have one location per group. So if there were 10 deer standing with each other, they would get one location. So here's a, a quick graph of um, the abundance over time um, of the total area surveyed. So this is the three locations combined. So you can see the left axis there is individual deer and then the bottom axis is date. So this is how abundance is changing over time. You can see that the abundance was fairly low um, in late March. And then as uh, April hit, the abundance went way up. You can see, I think it was April 8th, the abundance was up to 30 individuals. So these are individuals. This is abundance on that day. Um, so the maximum individuals that we saw in the whole area was 30. We saw 30 deer. Um, and you can see that it has a, a pretty large um, range. It goes from one to 30. And the average individuals per day is about, um, it was 12.65, so between um, 12 and 13. This is for location one specifically. I'll have one for each location, one, two, and three. This is just to break it down a little bit. So um, same day on four, it's kind of the same pattern very low um, late March, and then kind of a spike in early April, um, and then kind of a consistent number throughout May. Um, on, same as on 4-8, there were 22 deer in location one. Um, so that's the same day um, that there were 30 deer, I believe. 
Um, so this is location two. You can see that there is a wide variety. Um, it's hard to see a trend in this. It kind of just looks flat to me. Um, had an average individual per day of six. So there are about six individuals per day in location two. And then that maximum of 18. And then this is location three. Um, location three had the lowest abundance and was really, there weren't really many deer there. Um, you can see all the zeros and ones. Um, the maximum that we did see that day was 10 and those 10 actually um, were in location two to begin with. And then we actually spooked them into location three. They ran away from us as we were walking down the trail. So you can kind of tell that location three is not used as much an average individual per day of 1.5. So between one and two deer in all of location three per day. So abundance estimates um, can give us these density estimates. So density is kind of a more common approach when you're discussing population numbers um, because it incorporates the area at which that abundance um, was or estimated for. So then that's um, calculated by adding the number of individuals by the total area, um, and typically that's in square kilometers. So here I broke down the abundance for and density for the total area, location one, location two, and location three. So you can see for the total area, I have the average abundance, which I mentioned before. And then I divided that by the square kilometer, which um, I believe I showed before. So it was about the square uh, kilometer for location one was about 0.3, for location two it was at 0.31, and location three it was 0.25. And density range, you know, you can see from 16 to 20, average density for the whole area is about 16 deer per square kilometer. Um, that is higher than the estimates that were provided beforehand. Um, and you can see that location one and location two had significantly higher density estimates, 21 and 20-ish. Um, in location three, you can see that it's very low. So these estimate value, or these abundance values are sort of estimates. Um, it's a issue of, how did we see all the deer that were there? Um, and I think we can assume no. So as I mentioned, there's these issues with detection that have to do with weather and the canopy composition. So you can see on this picture here, these two pictures, you've seen the top right one, um, that's where there's nine deer there, but you can only see those two, the third one's missing now. And then the one on the left there is, the ground looks like lava. And if there were a deer standing in there, um, you would not be able to see its heat signature. So we can assume that over time, as we were flying, that we did not see every deer. And real abundance thus is likely higher than the abundance that we observed. Um, so we're going to be working on this in the future to estimate um, the statistical packages that allow you to estimate um, true abundance estimates from what you have seen. Um, so that will likely increase our abundance and then density. So um, 12.65 average density or average abundance, I'm sorry, will probably be higher and then so the average density. I'm not sure how much higher. I can't really speak to that yet. And then I wanted to talk about the possibility of extrapolating these results beyond the study area. So I wanted, I was thinking, can we assume that the average deer density in the study area um, is the same as the other locations in the pine bush? And I think this is unlikely because of the landscape dynamics and all the various habitat types. So some parts of the preserve are really landlocked in small parcels, um, while others are really large. And then there's also, you know, we had a variety of habitat types, but there's other habitat types that weren't included in this that deer might avoid. Um, so I really don't think it's possible to say that, you know, the average density was this much in our study area. So then it has to be that for the total pine bush property. But assuming we could all, you know, play along for now, um, you know, we have an observed average density of 16 deer per square kilometer. And then if we take into account the total pine bush preserve property square kilometer is about 23.5, you can then calculate the estimated abundance of deer in the preserve to be about 376. Um, so like I said, I really don't think that this is a great way to extrapolate beyond the study area. I mean, 
I would like to think that the area that we surveyed was a good representation of the overall pine bush habitat, but I don't think that that's a great way to go about, you know, fitting it into the entire um, pine bush ecosystem. So with that, with abundance covered, I wanted to get into some location and habitat things. So these are the maps that I have uh, that we built. And then these are all the red dots are the locations of the groups that we had seen. So you can identify some patterns right off the bat. Um, one thing I noticed was that, you know, something that we'd already mentioned in the abundance slides was location three um, had significantly less sightings. You can see that location one and location two there are highlighted. And there are far, far more locations there than in location three. We also observed that they were, um, they were frequently observed in areas of recent timber harvest. So these areas highlighted in blue are areas that um, over the past winter and you know, I'd say over the past year have undergone some harvesting um, of trees um, to thin out and make it more of a um, pine barren ecosystem. Um, and you can see that these areas have um, a good amount of clumps of locations there. We also frequently observe them in areas of dense pitch pine cover. Um, so these areas that I circled in blue are areas that have, um, that are dense in pitch pine. So the one in the top there, that's actually the one, the picture that I was showing you where there were nine um, and you could only see the three. That is one of the pitch pine forests there. You can see that they, they tend to be in those areas a lot. We also saw them in areas that had a lot of dune activity. So not all of the pine bush is, um, has these rolling dunes. There's some flatter areas, but there's a very large dune uh, in Blueberry Hill. Um, and we tended to see deer either on top of the dune, along sides of the dune, or down in between kind of dune valleys. Um, and same was noticed up in location three. There's also a large dune there and they, they like to be up there as well. And then we also frequently observe them close to the edge of the preserve boundary. So you can see all these locations in blue that I highlighted. These are all very close to the edge of the preserve. And I believe that would be from them um, just being an edge species, but also um, moving back and forth between preserve property and private property. So just south of um, location two there on the um, bottom right is a neighborhood. And I do believe that deer will move back and forth between that neighborhood. And then on the top left there, uh, 155 is right next to that. And they can cross 155 and go into other parts of the preserve. So I do believe that they're spending some time on the edge uh, moving back and forth. So you can see that there's a pretty large variation in abundance over time. Um, and as I mentioned before, you can see that in late March, it really is pretty low abundance. And then it kind of peaks here in early April. And I really believe that um, a lot of this is due to their seasonal movements, um, some of their daily movements. And then as I mentioned, their movements beyond the study location. So there are winter to summer seasonal movements, deer will yard in the winter. So they could have been in a different location. Um, and then as spring came, they decided that they would move over in here. Um, there's also, they spend time in fawning locations. So there has to be suitable, suitable habitat for them to have fawns. Um, and I believe that maybe perhaps the numbers, it looked like it declined in the spring. Um, I'll go back. You can see that the spring numbers um, through May look like they are slightly declining. Um, that might be because they're leaving to go to other areas to have their fawns. Then they also um, have seasonal movements based on food availability. So if there's um, a large patch of food that they can go to, they'll move there. Same with daily movements. If there's a large patch of food, they'll, they'll move to that area. Same for cover and for water. They also avoid predators and they avoid humans. So we noticed that while we were flying, um, especially at this time of day, there weren't that many people around. But if there were a lot of times, they would actually, the deer would actually be in location three. 
Um, so if there's people on the trail, they're getting pushed around, the deer are getting pushed around a lot and avoiding people. Um, I think they're really used to people. I don't believe they're very scared of people in this location, but they, they will move to different locations if there are people on the trails. And then they just move out of the study location in general. So they'll move into um, neighborhoods and other preserved locations, as I mentioned. So I want to talk about, um, there was a re question about their reaction. Um, so they had generally a very little reaction to the drone. Um, there is evidence of um, habituation. So they became kind of used to the drone being in the sky. So we were there um, every morning, not every morning. Um, sometimes we would go back to back. Sometimes there would be a few days in between where we would return, but they got used to the drone being in the sky. Um, early on, they would start kind of looking at it and being curious, but later on in the surveys, they showed very little reaction. They would just continue whatever they were doing. But there was some evidence of um, sex-specific reaction. So males, I believe, reacted somewhat different um, than females did. And I have a video to show um, that kind of shows evidence of this. Oops, too far. It's not responding here, my keys. Oh, come on, wrong way. Oh my gosh. Now it's responding all of a sudden. Sorry, my computer is freezing up a little bit here on me. So here's the video that I wanted to show you. So as I mentioned, it's a uh, potential sex-specific reaction. I believe this is a female deer that you're going to see. I think we may have lost you, Chris. Okay, there you are. We got you again. Got me here. You're staticky again. Yeah, my computer is not cooperating with this video. Well, I'm trying to show you here. This is a female deer that we were um, we ended up flying above, and we gradually lowered it above her. Um, we only did this once because we didn't want to disturb them too much. Um, but you can see the drone is getting closer and closer and it eventually gets very close. Um, and she has very little reaction. Um, she just lays there. You can just see she's very indifferent to the drone. She's looking around a little bit and that's that. However, this is a video that I took on the, the um, my parrot and the thermal there. That is a um, large mature male deer. Um, you can see the presence of the drone spooked it. Um, it did not just sit there um, peacefully. It ran. So I followed it just for a second here just to see if it would do anything else. And it took off totally. Um, so that's the only evidence that I really have of sex specific reactions because unfortunately during um, our study time with the 34 flights, deer did not have their antlers. So I wasn't able to tell if they were male or female deer. Um, but this was during October. Um, so they had their antlers and I was able to tell that that's a male. Shifting away from deer just for a second, um, the drone also gave us the ability to see some turkeys, which I thought was cool. This is late April. You can see a couple male turkeys there. Um, two, I think there's the third one over there on the right is a male, along with their harem of female turkeys, um, just kind of hanging out, doing their thing in late April. And then same here, there's, um, two adult male turkeys there. And um, it's hard to see, but there's also a small harem there, female turkeys. 
turkeys were pretty active in this area while we were flying. We would show up in the morning at uh, 5.30 and they would already be gobbling from late April to through mid-May. So as I mentioned, there's still some stuff that we need to do. So we are going to use these statistical programs to assess the possible abundance issue. So um, what I have right now, the abundance, it could not, or it might not be the total abundance. You know, there's detectability issues. So abundance could actually increase. And then that map that I showed you, the orthophoto map, um, we're going to use that map to create a habitat type map and then do more assessments on um, where we saw the deer in relation to their habitat type, especially over time. And then that, um, we're going to further explore their seasonality of their habitat selection. So during the winter months, late or early March, that's late winter, we'll see um, if they're using the habitat differently than they were, say, early May. So finally, um, thermal drones are a great tool to assess white-tailed deer population dynamics, um, and I believe that they really provide a more reliable abundance estimate um, other than the other methods. And then they provide an ability to survey a vast area. So we were studying um, nearly 0.8 square kilometers. It was quite a few hundred acres that we were able to cover in one morning. Um, and then I also believe that deer use these variety of habitat types in the preserve. So they're not just confined to one habitat type. They really use all the habitat types for different um, aspects of their life from eating, finding cover, um, fleeing. And then abundance at any one location varies greatly um, daily and seasonally. So you saw on those abundance maps, they go up and down. Um, and it's hard to say um, exactly why the abundance changes. And then I demonstrated that, you know, I tried to extrapolate results um, from our study to the other preserve areas, but I don't believe, I think it's difficult to do that um, because of the different habitat types and uh, landscape dynamics. I really want to thank uh, my professor, um, Dr. Boyanta, for being there um, all the time. He was there for every flight, and he really did all of the, the mapping processes. I want to thank the Geography and Planning Department um, from the University of Albany. They um, provided funding for the second drone and for some expertise. I want to thank the Pine Bush Preserve Commission staff um, for allowing me just to perform the study. Um, specifically, I want to th thank um, Dr. Steve Campbell uh, for his insights on data analysis and kind of planning. Uh, he's there. Shout out to Steve. Hello. Um, I want to thank Dr. Dan Bogan uh, for his insight on data analysis. He is a professor at um, Siena. Then I just want to thank friends, family, and um, some of my academic colleagues um, for some moral and academic support. I know Veronique, you're out there. Um, so hello and thank you. And that will be it for uh, the presentation part. I would be open to questions and comments at this time. And I uh, really thank you for being here and thanks for listening to what I had to say. I hope you learned a lot and enjoyed uh, seeing drones in action for wildlife. That was awesome, Chris. Thank you so much. That was a lot of work and a lot of post-processing of data. So yeah. that's awesome. So there are a couple questions. Dan, I will say, I asked you a question I was just having trouble understanding what your question was. So if you want to re-ask it, um, we'll get it on Chris's list. Um, in the meantime, um, Anthony asked, um, and I believe this was in reference um, to the possible difference you saw in the, the sexes and their mm -hmm. reaction to the drones. He asked if you attributed this to hunting pressure in the preserve. Probably, yeah. So the area that that was, that um, male was seen, was over off Kings Road. Um, and I do know that people hunt there. Um, and male deer, I believe, are just more skittish to begin with. Um, they're more occlusive. Um, so I do think it has to do with hunting pressure. Um, also just the, the behavioral nature of male versus female deer. All right. Mike says, great presentation. How much would a drone fitted out for this research cost and what issues did you have with using it for this purpose as far as legal permits, mechanical issues with neighbors, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, 
I'll, I heard cost first. So the para Anafi Thermal, um, that came with three batteries, the drone itself and the carrying case, that was $1,900. Um, and an issue that I had with that drone actually was it doesn't have um, obstacle avoidance on the drone. So that's actually what caused it to crash. Is we were, I was flying it along a flight plan and it, there was a tree in the way of the flight plan that I didn't um, take into consideration, I suppose, and it crashed into the tree. Um, and eventually the drone didn't recover from that crash. Um, the DJI Mavic 2, um, the thermal is $3,900. And that also comes with a carrying case, um, three batteries and the drone, same camera, um, but it also has obstacle avoidance and it has all of the DJI um, software, which is uh, probably the best software out there compared to any other drone, including Parrot. And it also had the DJI drones have third party softwares that are compatible, which um, includes that UGCS software, which I was discussing. Um, so I really believe that the $3,900 is worth it for the other drone for the software and just the dependability that you get with DJI products. Was there another um, part of that question? Uh, yeah, he just asked, um, do you have any issues with using it um, for your research? So like with legal or permits, uh, you kind of talked right. about mechanical issues, but did you have any issues with neighbors? Um, neighbors, no. Um, there were some people on the trail that were just kind of interested. Um, one of the things that was really useful is we were there um, really early in the morning, so there weren't many people around. But, you know, we were concerned about, you know, people's privacy on the trails. We didn't want to disrupt people. Um, legally, the drone has to be within line of sight at all times, so we were kind of limited to where we could fly, actually. That's one of the reasons why we chose the site is because it had some higher elevation points where we could launch the drone and be able to see it at all times. It's actually illegal to fly a drone out of line of sight. So we had to maintain line of sight at all times. So that was something um, legally that we had to do. Um, nothing else really, uh, if you're doing it to make money, which I'm not, um, you have to have your um, part 107, 107, um, license to fly a drone to make money. Um, we didn't have to have that because we weren't doing it for money purposes. So you didn't need any other permits or anything for it? Correct, yeah. Uh, Kiko says, could you estimate the age distribution from the hotspot sizes? It's possible. There are um, papers that do that actually um, in the journals. Um, I haven't done it. Um, it might even be easier, not from the hotspot size, but actually from the size of the deer in the, the visible, um, you can tell much easier the size of the deer uh, comparatively. But it, I think it would be hard to say sometimes if uh, it was a small adult or a large uh, yearling deer. We didn't see any fawns. Um, so that would, you know, we couldn't say how many fawns there were. And then it was hard to do uh, sexing at that time since the um, males didn't have their antlers. Gotcha. Kind of a, a similar um, along those lines, April was wondering if you have to look at every image to confirm that it's a deer um, or if there were like, were there other animals that could be mistaken for deers or did you have a computer program that would identify them? Um, we no, no computer program was used, although there are some people that do that, um, not with deer, but with other animals. And um, we did not see, I mean, we saw the turkeys and they had a small hot spot, um, but I would have to watch, I watched it all and I made sure that they were deer. There was one instance where we saw a hot spot that was smaller. Um, it could have been a coyote, but I'm not positive, but we didn't see any other um, wildlife. I think I actually, I saw a hawk one time that was a hot spot and I was trying to see if there was a deer on the ground for a long time. And then I finally saw the hawk sitting in the top of the tree that was giving off the hot spot. Um, but yes, I did have to go through every single one and look for the hot spots and confirm if it was a deer or not. That's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, luckily I did it during the process. So I would do it a lot after flight. So I didn't have to sit down and watch all of it at once. I did it over the course of months. 
Awesome. All right, thank you, Dan, so much. Um, so Dan says, uh, selective timber harvest got lots of backlash with people um, on Facebook. So you mentioned in the presentation that areas of recent thinning were, were possibly preferred by the deer. So um, where the treetops were left, or was it open um, from, um, was it from now open canopy and sunlight creating young growth? So he's, he's questioning, uh, do you have any ideas about why they might have preferred that, um, those recently harvested areas? Yeah, I think that it probably is a lot from the, the canopy branches that were left. So here actually in this image, um, to the left of this dune, you can see a dark, a large dark area. There's a couple of trees left there with some orange leaves. Um, but that's an area that had just been recently thinned and you can see a lot of sticks on the ground. And that's an area where we saw deer a lot. And I do believe that they were in there early on in the, uh, in the winter into early spring um, browsing that those tops and then as you said that it opens up some light so there was a lot of new growth there same with farther back in the image you can't really see it that well but that's another location where it had been thinned um, and same thing I do believe that yes that's pretty cool stuff um, Gary was wondering if you need any um, FAA licenses in order to fly drones at night or near the Albany Airport yeah, so um, flying drones at night, you do need an FAA license. So that's why we didn't fly at night. Night would be preferred actually um, because of the impact of the, the sun and everything and the temperature. It's actually the ground is the coolest, obviously at night, there's no sun. Um, flying close to the airport, we did have to run into, um, you ha we were within five miles of the airport. So you actually have to clear your flights with the, the ground control there um, and that just took us, there's an app that you just do that. You tell them when you're flying and where, and it basically gets approved in seconds. Um, but if you're not flying within five miles of an airport, it's not a big deal. All right. Eric says, thank you for the presentation. It would be interesting to see how the habitat restoration cuts and burns in some areas affect deer bedding areas and travel routes, along with abundance levels versus those areas that have been left alone. Yeah, it certainly would. That would be a great direction in the future um, for other areas of the preserve as well. Um, I don't think there were any burns recently while we were doing this. I mean, obviously it was the winter, so no burns were happening, but it would be interesting if there were to be a burn here and then to go back next year and see what were to happen. Or, yeah, I agree. Uh, Anthony said, are you noticing a negative impact on butterfly habitat in higher deer density areas? And how does the pine bush combat this generally? I don't think I can really speak to that question. I don't know. If, so the butterfly habitat really is about lupin. Um, and I don't know for certain if deer eat lupin or not. I believe they do. I'm, I saw a rabbit eating lupin while we were out. I know that, you know, mammals do eat. I saw a mammal eating lupin. I don't know if deer selectively do. Um, so I really, I don't, I don't know. It's possible. Um, yeah. They do. The, the deer do eat lupin. Um, when we, back early on, when we, we had less acreage of lupin in the pine bush, we would actually put up electric fences around mm. some lupin to keep the deer out um, because we collect, we also collect the seed from lupin for our restoration efforts. So some of our high density lupin areas, we would actually fence the deer out. Um, we don't fence anymore. We have enough lupin on the landscape that we can get enough seed without having to fence anymore. So it's certainly an interesting question. Um, mm -hmm. and we've always been, the, the commission is curious about deer because of that potential for overbrowsing um, and impacting the quality of the habitat for other animals. So that's why work like Chris's is so important. And we're so thankful to have partners doing that. <laughs> Um, I don't think I have any more questions, Chris. I've got a lot of kudos. Um, a lot of people saying thank you for all the information. I learned a lot. Um, this talk is awesome. So great, great job. Um, we'll do a last call for anybody who has um, any questions. Oh, there's one just popped up. Uh, Brendan says, have you seen any advancements in technology that would allow for better detection through the forest canopy? If not, is this approach only relegated to open areas or during leaf off? I haven't seen any advances. Um, 
through a forest canopy, no. Um, there are some, so this I, I have to mention um, to answer this question that, so our thermal camera was actually the lowest resolution camera possible um, for a thermal camera. Some thermal cameras are, um, they have much higher resolution. Um, so that's um, centimeters per pixel um, or a number of pixels essentially um, in the picture. And with that, you can see through um, the canopy potentially better, um, see hot spots better through the canopy. But if you had a really closed canopy, um, I really don't think that that high of a resolution camera is really gonna help you that much more. I really do think that it's um, the best detection is um, in these open areas or times of leaf off during the winter and uh, fall. That's what, um, you know, the open areas of the pine bush really make this an ideal habitat um, to study too. All right. Well, thank you very, very much, Chris. Um, and thank you so much to all of our attendees um, for your, uh, for joining us tonight. Um, some of you have asked if the presentation will be posted and um, we do plan to post it on our YouTube channel um, by next week. So um, if you missed anything or if you wanna share it with anybody else, um, you can feel free to, to check out our YouTube channel. So thank you again, Chris, so much um, for talking about your work. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you everybody who came and listened. Um, I was very happy to share everything with you and I hope you learned a lot. Thanks, Dylan. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Tune in next month.